The Word of God is a sure foundation that has stood the test of time. Sadly, millions have built their religion on the ever-shifting sands of human opinion. Jesus warned only those who anchor their faith on the unchanging rock of His Word will stand through the coming storm. Join us now as Amazing Facts presents Here We Stand, Foundations of Our Faith. Good evening, friends, and welcome again. Here we stand, foundations of our faith. You know, when the children of Israel were wandering through the wilderness, they cried for water, and God gave them water from the rock. And of course, Paul tells us that that rock was Jesus. It is our desire that as a result of this revival series, we may all drink a little fuller of that living water, the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. And that our feet would, our feet would be firmly planted on Jesus, the Rock of Ages. We'd like to extend a very special welcome to those of you who are joining us via satellite across the country, around the world. We are truly grateful that you've chosen to be a part of this revival series. Well, at this time, I'd like to invite John Lomacain once more to come out and lead us in our theme song, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less Than Jesus' Blood and Righteousness. Let's all stand together as we sing our theme song, Join Us Wherever You Are. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all of the ground is sinking sand. All of the ground is sinking sand. Amen. This evening our prayer will be brought to us by the assistant pastor of the Sterling Heights Seventh-day Adventist Church, Royce Odiar. We'll kneel together, but remain standing for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the opportunity to be gathered here together. Lord, here we stand, and we just thank you for the Word of God. And we recognize that it's upon the Word of God that we must stand. Otherwise, we will sink because all other ground is sinking sand. And so, Lord Jesus, tonight I pray that you'll be with Pastor Doug, that you'll just anoint his lips. But not only anoint his lips, anoint the minds of each person here and each person listening to this broadcast. Anoint the, our minds, Lord, so that we might understand the truths of Scripture that are being presented tonight. The truths that will help us to stand through the darkest hours of earth's history. Because, Lord, that is what we need. There's nothing more that we need than the support of Scripture and the support of the Holy Spirit in, in going through the last days, Lord. And so we just pray that we will be able to gain another, another tool another uh, just part that will, piece of the puzzle that will help us to strong, stand strong. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Evening, friends. Evening. Good to see each of you here, and I want to welcome you once again, those who are here in Lansing, Michigan, and those who are watching, to our Here We Stand program. This is something of a uh, a hybrid of a revival, a challenge for us to take a stand for the Word of God, and also it's something of an explanation. We're looking at some of the, the uh, distinctive teachings of the Seventh-day Adventist movement. Now, when this series is over, Pastor Ross, uh, is it just back to life as normal, or how can we capitalize on this program? What, what can we do for follow-up? You know, the message is, Pastor Doug, that you've been presenting every night, it's too good to keep to ourselves. 
We need to share that with other people. Amen. And um, something that I'm just so excited about, I'm holding in my hand the Empowered Church Kit. Now, it's taken amazing facts well over a year to put all of the details together in this Empowered Church Kit. But in a nutshell, what this is, this is a kit that a church can get that will help it set up an ongoing evangelism cycle. So that evangelism isn't just an event that happens once or twice in the life of the church, but it's ongoing. It, it's part of the culture of the church. It's, um, it's a process, not just an event. This kit is filled with all kinds of great resources, including DVDs, training seminars, agendas for meetings for the outreach leadership team, information for the church board, information on certain uh, community uh, seminars to meet the needs of people in the community. Everything you can imagine on setting up an evangelism cycle is right here. Now, there's a whole section in there on revival too. There is. There's actually uh, two months dedicated to revival as well as discipleship resources. What do you do with the people that have heard these truths, that's made their stand with God's commandment keeping people? How do you nurture them and disciple them into a long-term growing relationship with Jesus? Now, part of the reason that this has developed, friends, is for years we've been doing revivals and evangelism with 3ABN, and people often say it was great, but when it's over, we're afraid that it's going to sort of gravitate back to the regular cycle. And so with this in mind, we want to have an ongoing, growing revival program, and we're so excited. This just came off the press. I think the ink is still drying. I, I think so. I'm so excited. It's the first time I'm seeing it when it's all together. We made sure that they shipped it directly from the printing company here to Lansing, Michigan, so we'd have some to show the folks. Um, now, you're probably wondering, well, how, do, how can we get our church involved in something like this? Uh, take a look at the Empowered Church website. It's simply www.empoweredchurch.org or .com, or you can go to the Amazing Facts website, amazingfacts.org.com, or call 916-434-3880, and just ask, please tell me more about the Empowered Church program and they'll be happy to contact and connect you with the right people. But we're thrilled about this, Pastor Amen. Doug, and we trust that it will bless a lot of churches and a lot of people as they set up this ongoing evangelism cycle. I'm just wondering how many phones going to be ringing off the hook Monday, huh? Well, you better <laughs> wait until Tuesday because that's when I get back to the office next week, <laughs> and we'll be able to answer the questions then. But doesn't this make sense, friends? If we just have meetings like this, you know, once a year, we need something that is going on in the churches on a regular basis. Absolutely. Questions? It says, last night the preacher, Pastor Doug, spoke about the remnant of the remnant. Please explain. Well, I, I was saying that sort of in the context that not everybody who may be part of the remnant church on the books is necessarily has the seal of God in their hearts. Uh, and matter of fact, uh, I've heard things that maybe one in 20. And so we may discover that as we near the end that there's a lot of folks who are sort of just going along for the ride. And when persecution arises, it will be a remnant of the remnant that really stands true. I wish it was everybody, but the Bible doesn't really teach that. Okay, well, the next question dealing with that same topic, do I have to join a church to be saved? Yeah. <laughs> well, the Bible says that the church is the body of Christ, and you must be in Christ, the dead in Christ. When we're baptized, we're baptized in Christ. And along the heels of that, Pastor Ross, I'm hearing folks say, well, I'm not going to join a church. I'm just getting baptized into Christ. Oh, no, 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 no. That's wrong. That's bad theology. You can't do that. That's like saying, I am going to get baptized into nothing. You are baptized into the body of Christ. And so to say I'm getting baptized into Jesus and not becoming part of the family is like telling a gal, uh, this is, you know, like a man who would be telling a girl, I want to get married, but I don't want to live with you. I don't want to support you. I don't want any responsibility. But I want the benefits. Uh, baptism, you're becoming part of the family of Christ. And so, you know, that's, that's sort of a, a, a modern irresponsible attitude about Christianity. You can't be a Christian without being part of a church any more than a bee can produce honey without being part of a hive or it's like a football player without a team or a politician without voters or a writer without readers. I mean, I could go on and on. It just doesn't make sense. You've got to be part of a church. The Bible says that the church is a flock and if a lamb is outside the flock, the wolves are going to get it. You are a baby Christian when you're baptized. You need to be put into a family or you are really at risk. 
You know, Pastor Doug, I remember this a number of years back. You did a series of meetings like this, and somebody asked the question, well, I don't want to belong to a church because I don't necessarily like the people in the church. I remember your answer. You said, in the days of the ark, there were a few skunks on board, but it was still the safest place to be when the flood came. That's right. <laughs> All right, here's the next question. In Revelation, Jesus said that I am Alpha and Omega. What does this mean? Well, several things. Alpha and Omega is the first and the last letters in the Greek alphabet. And Christ is the Word. And every word in the Scripture is made up of one of those letters. And so Christ is the essence of the Word of God. Everything in the Word of God is contained in who He is. Alpha is also the first, Omega was the last, and the Bible says that from everlasting to everlasting thou art God. As far as you can go in this direction and as far as you can go in this direction, He is there. He is God. Okay, next question. Can you please explain what Pardon God's... Pardon me. Yes. One more thought. Jesus is also everything you need in salvation. He is there for the beginning and He's there for the middle and He's there for the end. He's the author and the finisher of our faith, Alpha and Omega. Well, maybe one more thing about Alpha and Omega. The first and the last letters of the Greek alphabet, we use the letters of the alphabet to make words. In John chapter 1, Jesus is said to be the Word of God, God's thoughts revealed. That's Jesus right. reveals God to us. That's okay, a good point. Um, please can you explain what is the glory of God and more important, how can we manifest that in our lives? Well, one time Moses asked the Lord, please reveal to me your glory in the book of Exodus. And what he did was the Lord, that's the story where he was put in the cleft of the rock. And uh, the Lord passed by and instead of saying, oh, this is what color he was and this is how tall he was, it says he described his character. And so the glory of God is the character of God. And we want the glory of God, the character of God. And Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. We want the character of Jesus then to be reproduced in our lives. How do we get that? The same way a photographic plate absorbs an image. It is facing towards that image and it absorbs that image. As we keep our eyes turned on Jesus, if we looked at Him, we keep our eyes fixed upon Him as the author and finisher of our faith, we become transformed into His likeness by beholding. What does that have to do with then um, the seal of God? Has that got something to do with the seal of God? Well, the seal of God is placed on those who have the character of Christ and the glory of God reproduced in their lives. That, those are the ones who will receive the seal. Okay. Does God forgive people of their sins before they ask? The Lord has provided forgiveness, but the check does not get cashed. You don't benefit from it until you ask. Now, in one sense, everybody today benefits from the life of Christ in that the penalty for sin is death, correct? But even the wicked who are walking the earth today are alive because of the sacrifice of Jesus. In other words, He bought them probationary time to make a decision to accept Him. You see what I'm saying? Well, the reason we aren't dead right now is because the Lord loves us. He not only died to provide forgiveness, He died to buy us time to make a decision to accept Him. But we don't receive forgiveness unless we ask. We've been quoting that verse in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves, that's in the context of repentance, and pray and seek my face, then I will hear their prayer, I'll forgive their sin and heal their land. So we must ask. Ask and you'll receive. He didn't say receive and then ask, right? Ask first. Okay. Can you please explain the investigative judgment? Well, we touched on this the other night when we talked about the 2,300 day or 2,300 year prophecy. Very simply, the Bible says that when the Lord comes, behold, He comes and His reward is with Him when He comes. If Jesus is rewarding people when He comes, and if there's a judgment before people receive their rewards, and if it's the dead in Christ who rise first when He comes, and if the Bible says judgment must begin at the house of God, then some judgment must take place before He comes. That's what we call the pre-advent judgment, or sometimes the investigative judgment. It's a judgment, Ezekiel chapter 9. It says, begin at my sanctuary, if you read that prophecy in there. And so those who have had the greatest opportunity to embrace the truth, who have taken a stand for the truth, 
uh, they're going to be evaluated for their genuineness. They're not going to be admitted into heaven simply based on a profession. I mean, after all, Judas claimed to be a follower of Christ, didn't he? But he wasn't authentic. So the, that group is going to be clarified during that time. You can read in Daniel chapter 7. Oh, we got stuff on our website, that de whole lessons that deal with that. Amazingfacts.org. You know, there's another website. I forgot to give it the other night. BibleProphecyTruth.com. We have charts up there that talk about the dates that we gave. BibleProphecyTruth.com. Oh, that, must, that must be a new one. It's John Quaid. Out. Yeah, he emailed oh, okay, me. I meant, great. To, meant to tell Super. about that. All right, here's a question. Do Seventh-day Adventists believe, as do most Christians, in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Well, there are little variations uh, among different groups, but yes, uh, we believe in what's sometimes referred to as the Trinity. The word Trinity is not in the Bible. Don't let that discourage you. Do you know the word Bible is not in the Bible either? But we still call it the Bible, right? It's just a collect bibliose, collection of books. Uh, there is one God, but God said, let us make man in our image. A husband and wife get married, they become one flesh, but they're still two individuals. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit are three distinct persons, but they comprise one God, and that is uh, what we believe. Okay, uh, a question dealing with end time events. You mentioned a small time of trouble. Can you please explain what this means? Uh, yeah, if you uh, write a check and you don't have the money in the bank account, <laughs> that's a big time. That's of a big trouble. time of trouble. <laughs> Now, they, in the last days, there are two phases that seem to be identified. When the seven plagues are poured out, that is the Great Tribulation. That will probably be more intense, but not as long as the period that precedes it, sometimes talked about as the small time of trouble. There will be a period of testing before probation closes when people are told they cannot buy or sell, they're going to be persecuted for their faith, some may have to flee into more remote places because of the persecution. Um, you had three and a half year, there was a small time of trouble for Elijah, but then he had to flee into the wilderness after that three and a half year period. And the disciples preached in Jerusalem for three and a half years, and then after the stoning of Stephen, there was a great persecution, and they fled and went everywhere else preaching. And so, I don't know how long the small time of trouble will be, but it seems that there will be a smaller period uh, just before the plagues fall. Well, I hope you'll be praying tonight. We have um, a very important subject we'd like to share with you. And as I often do, I like to begin with an amazing fact. September 15th of this year, a young lady by the name of Eva Wisnierska, who was a 35-year-old German paraglider, was in New South Wales, Australia, uh, involved in the championships there. You've seen these uh, uh, paragliders, they've got the, uh, like the half a parachute that they sail through the sky on, and they're non-powered. And uh, while she was up in the air, the weather changed. Sometimes they soar for hours. Okay, they catch the currents. Thunderstorms moved in, and she was sucked up into a massive supercell thundercloud. She radioed with her radio to her crew on the ground and said, I'm going up 65 feet a second and uh, I can't stop. I don't know where I am. I'm being beaten up by hailstones. She called back. There's ice forming on my gloves. They're stuck to the controls. There's ice on the paraglider. And they could see on their equipment on the ground the GPS tracking device she had, pretty soon the radio went silent. They found her, oh, about uh, an hour later. She was at a farm about 20 miles away on the ground. And she tells the story that she was caught up into this cloud and kept going up, 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 and saw lightning all around her and occasional rainbows and hail and just the majesty of it was the most awesome thing. And Pretty soon she got up where she was feeling frozen all over and frostbite. She was pulled up 32,000 feet that day. Now you realize that jets don't even fly that high. Well, I mean, some do, but that's oxygen. People can't live without oxygen up there for very long. If 50 degrees below zero, she had frostbite on her face. And she woke up, she was descending. She still managed a perfect landing and curled up in the fetal position until she could melt the ice 
and our crew found her with the tracking devices. That was some miracle. The, uh, the one who manned the event said, the chances of her surviving an experience like that is like winning the lottery 10 times in a row. The record before that was 20,000 feet. She passed it by 12,000 feet. It's pretty amazing, caught up to the heavens. Our study tonight is going to deal with another woman who was caught up to heaven, so to speak. We're going to talk about something tonight that uh, I think people need to hear, and it's a very important subject. The title of the uh, sermon tonight is Messenger for a Movement. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about an individual called Ellen G. White, and she is one of the founders of the Seventh-day Adventist movement. And the way it began was back in 1844. Uh, because Christians looked at the prophecies in Daniel chapter 8 that talked about 2,300 days, the sanctuary would be cleansed, they calculated and recalculated those dates. And they had the dates right, but they had the event wrong. They thought what was going to happen is the sanctuary being cleansed, the earth was the sanctuary, Christ would come cleanse the earth. But nothing in the Bible says that the earth is the sanctuary. God is a sanctuary in heaven. Do you realize the New Testament church was born from a great misunderstanding? The disciples were sure. They understood the prophecies that Jesus was going to flex his Messiah muscles and overthrow the Romans and seat himself on the throne of David and Israel was going to reign over the world. They, they had this whole concept even right up until the last time when they were on their way to Jerusalem. Jesus said, you just don't get it. I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to die. I'll ride the Thursday. And it says they just could not understand it. Even after he rose, they said, Lord, will you at this time set up the kingdom? They, they misunderstood. So it shouldn't surprise us that God raises up a great movement, sometimes from the bowels of a great disappointment. Well, when Jesus did not come in 1844, as many Christians believed all around the world, they were in South America and Europe and North America. It was called the Great Advent Movement. And it has nothing to do with Seventh-day Adventists in the sense that they were not organized as a church until another 23 or 20 years later approximately. But uh, some of them said, what do we do? Uh, where did we go wrong? And they kept studying and they discovered, well, we had the date right. It's the event. There's a sanctuary in heaven. Christ has entered his final work and God began cleansing the sanctuary on earth. They said, let's put aside our differences and find out what the Bible really teaches. And so Presbyterians and Baptists and Methodists and people from all different backgrounds said, let's forget about our denominational differences and find out what the Bible really teaches. And it was during that time of Christians coming together, these believers who had been so excited about the prospect of Jesus coming, they said, let's find out what the Bible really teaches this movement, the Seventh-day Adventist movement, was born. In one of those meetings, while some ladies were praying one day, Ellen G. White, 17 years old at the time, in very frail health, uh, many of her friends and the physicians thought that she was actually terminal at that time, she went into vision. And she was shown the movement of God's people towards the city of God. And just overwhelmed with the, the power of God and the glory of God. And from that point when she was 17 years old, not only did she survive, she lived another 70 years and she had about 2,000 visions during that time. And through the guidance that God gave this movement, through this very frail um, young lady, uh, it became the fastest growing Protestant, Protestant movement in the world today. And I'd like to have you look with an honest eye at the possibility that God has sent a real prophet in these last days for people to be guided by, to learn from, that people are still inspired by God's Spirit. Let's go to the uh, Bible. I'm going to give you a lot of scripture. I hope that you've got some, uh, something to record this with. I'm going to use the question answer format once again. Number one, what primary warning did Jesus give about the last days? Uh, a number of times in the Gospels, Jesus tells his followers, Matthew 7, verse 15, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. And again, in Matthew 24, verse 11, Many false prophets will rise and deceive many. And we've seen that, haven't we? 
There's been no shortage of false prophets. Jesus said there'd be many. Now, you notice he did not say there won't be any true prophets. If, if the Lord is warning us to be on our guard about false prophets, that would imply that somewhere there are true prophets. Otherwise, Jesus would have said in the last days, watch out for anybody who says they're a prophet. He didn't say that. He said, watch out for the false ones because they're going to be the majority. And so whenever anybody says that they're a prophet, I'm naturally very suspicious. All you've got to do is stand in line at the supermarket and you see all the tabloids constantly are, are uh, touting some, the latest prophecy. And of course, you know, there are folks who are still avid followers of everybody from Nostradamus to Gene Dixon and Edgar Cayce and there's lots of people who claim to be prophets. Many of the tabloid prophets are just talking about the movie stars and what they're going to do next. And I don't really see Bible prophets focusing on, you know, who Elizabeth Taylor is going to marry next. You don't have to be a prophet to know she's going to get married again, do you? <laughs> and I mean, that's the kind of stuff that they're dealing with and, and politics. And, uh, and, and I heard one person actually took a lot of these supermarket tabloids and he investigated and calculated it and did some statistics. And after a uh, couple of years of studying, out of 250 specific predictions, I think less than 3% were considered accurate. And that was even a stretch. That's sort of like trying to catch a duck by just firing a shotgun into the clouds and hoping you get one flying by. Uh, you have just as good an odd. Number two, what types of false prophets are condemned in the Bible? Now there's quite a few in this category here. Let's look at some of them. Number A or letter A. One who uses divination. Oh, by the way, most of this is found in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 10 and on. One that uses divination, that's like a fortune teller. People who are reading your cards, uh, Christians should have nothing to do with that. An observer of times, or more precisely, an astrologer. You know how many people read their horoscopes? That, to me, I think that's so pathetic because when I grew up in New York City, my mother actually wrote for tabloid magazines. She was a songwriter too. She was a reporter for the Midnight Star, or the Midnight Globe rather. And uh, my mother wrote uh, a cassette tape, uh, Love Songs According to the Zodiac. There were 12 songs that she wrote, one for each sign of the Zodiac, and it sold and did very well. And I asked mom, I said, do you believe that stuff? She says, are you kidding? And so here you've got all these people who are writing these horoscopes and they're giving readings and if you ask them in a quiet spot, do you really believe this stuff? They just snicker. They're just taking people's money. It's, it's so tragic. And yet there, there are people who really believe in that. And they're constantly wanting to know whether or not it's safe to go shopping that day based on their horoscope. And, and they always say something like, today something interesting will happen to you. It's always very vague, you know. So like fortune cookies. But uh, now, astrology is condemned by the Bible. That's not to be confused with astronomy, which is the fascinating and legitimate science of studying the heavens. There's nothing wrong with that. Another one, answer C, an enchanter or a magician. And, you know, let's face it, a lot of magicians, I'm not talking about the person who comes to the birthday party and, and does something with a banana as a trick. Uh, we're, we're talking about the ones who are, you know, pretending that there's supernatural powers involved. And if, if you, I'm going to probably get questions on this. If you got any doubt about something like this, ask yourself, can you picture Jesus, a Christian's a follower of Jesus, right? Can you picture, picture Jesus trying to impress everybody by sawing an apostle in half? <laughs> I mean, you know, what's exactly the purpose of that? Uh, it's based on deception, even the ones who admit it's all a trick. It's just, let me show you how I can deceive you. Uh, Deuteronomy 18.10 says, a witch, which is a female psychic, someone who can read your future, um, which is like a fortune teller. A charmer, a person who casts spells and charms, the, the voodoo and the incantations that they perform. Christians shouldn't be involved, obviously, in that. And something that's a little more obvious these days, a consulter with familiar spirits. It's mind-boggling to me. Here we are in a very sophisticated, supposedly modern, educated, technological society. And yet folks are talking to people on TV and, and they're being interviewed by the news agencies that can supposedly consult with the dead. And they say, oh, I can see your dead family. They're behind you right now. And they're trying to tell you something. Let me tell you what they're trying to tell you. Well, those folks are in communication with the devil, I think. And Christians should have nothing to do with that business. It's a spirit medium. And uh, this is one that's more popular recently, Sylvia Brown. 
G, a wizard or a male psychic. Um, again, somebody who is, it's, that's sort of the, the male version of the witch. Now, if you think that uh, this is irrelevant, let me just remind you, it's a lot more common in high places than you might dream. I, I told you, I grew up, mother lived in Beverly Hills, film critic, president of the film critics there, lived in New York City, lived in Miami Beach, and uh, I was around a lot of these people, very wealthy. Um, there's a whole lot of spiritualism in high places. Not everybody, but it's very uh, pervasive. Some of you remember a few years ago when Nancy Reagan, it finally came out that she was consulting the Zodiac as she scheduled the president's appointments. How many of you remember that? How many of you remember when they began to tease Mrs. Clinton? She was talking to a friend who was a spirit medium and Mrs. Clinton let out of the bag she was trying to get a hold of Eleanor Roosevelt. Does anyone remember that? And so, and I'm sure there's a lot more that I don't know about and we haven't heard about these folks that are dabbling with the occult for guidance. Well, they may get some messages, but it won't be a message from Jesus. The devil gives messages too, and that should trouble us a little bit. So there's plenty of false prophets out there. Number three, are prophets still part of God's plan for his church today, in the last days? What does the Bible say? Acts chapter 2, Peter's preaching. He's quoting from the book of Joel chapter 2. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh in the last days. And your sons and your daughters will prophesy. So does he say in the last days that uh, sons and daughters will prophesy, old men will dream dreams, young men will see visions? Malachi chapter 4 verse 5, last prophecy in the Old Testament. Behold, I send you Elijah the prophet. Now I want to pause there because Jesus tells us in John chapter 10 rather, no John, I'm sorry, Matthew 11, Jesus tells us that John the Baptist was the fulfillment of coming in the spirit and power of Elijah. But Jesus said that he was not the only fulfillment. He said, indeed, Elijah has already come, and they've done to him whatever they will, because he was arrested and executed, and Elijah will come. There's a future coming. You read the rest of this verse back here in Malachi 4 verse 5. Behold, I send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So the same spirit and power of Elijah that got the world ready during Jesus' first coming is going to precede his second coming. Well, I send you Elijah the prophet. Prophecy is a gift that still will be needed in the last days. Number four, will God's end time church have the gift of prophecy? Being a little more specific now. If you look in Revelation 12, 17, you remember in our study last night, we read the last verse there said, the dragon was wroth with the woman and he went to make war, who does a dragon especially hate? The remnant, the remainder of her seed, two characteristics that keep the commandments of God, we've talked about the Ten Commandments and the law, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Catch that. She's got the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now what does that mean? Let the Bible explain itself. If you go to the same book, Revelation chapter 19 verse 10, John is getting ready to worship the angel that's giving him this tour of heaven during his vision. And the angel says, don't do that. You're to just worship God. I am of thy fellow servants, of thy brethren, that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So we just read that the last church is going to have the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus. And the angel says the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And so is the spirit of prophecy going to be one of the gifts of the spirit in the last days? And when you look through the gifts of the spirit, prophecy is one of those gifts. God hasn't withdrawn his promise to give any of those gifts to the church. I believe in all of them, including tongues, though it has been misapplied and misinterpreted by many. I believe in miracles. I believe in all the gifts of the spirit. I believe we're going to see the same kind of power among God's people in modern times that you witness in apostolic times in the last days. That's right. Number five, to whom does God reveal his final plans? Amos chapter 3 verse 7, surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. 
The Lord does nothing unless He reveals it to His servants, the prophets. Meaning, whenever God does anything significant in the last days through history, He always raises up a prophet. For instance, when God was ready to destroy the world because of their wickedness with a flood, did the Lord send a prophet to help prepare them? What was his name? Huh? Noah, okay. When he was getting ready to pour plagues out on Egypt and deliver them from their bondage, did he send a prophet? What was his name? Moses. Before they were carried off to Babylon, did he send a prophet to warn them? Did they have a prophet while they were in Babylon? Daniel. Did he send prophets to lead them out of Babylon? Ezra, Nehemiah. When Jesus came the first time, did he send to John the Baptist? And then in the early church, were there prophets? Number six, what is the most important test of a prophet? Well, we're going to look at, there's several tests for what a true prophet is. And uh, we've already talked about false prophets and how to avoid them. We know what that uh, definition is now. How do we identify if someone's a true prophet? Let's face it, be honest with me. If someone walked up to you, you just met them on the street, and they looked normal enough, but they said, I've just come to tell you that I'm a prophet, and I've got a message for you. How many of you will honestly say your first impression would be that you're talking to a kook? Okay, you get an audience? Hold your hands back up. I want them to see that back at home. All right, well, you're just as cynical as I am, because probably that's what I would do. But what would it take if God did want to send a prophet to you with a message? How would he get your attention? What are the tests that you would apply so you could know if this person is genuine or just one of the many wolves in sheep's clothing? The Bible gives some tests. What is the most important test to determine if a person is a true prophet? For at least for a Christian, it's a very easy one. Isaiah 8 verse 20, to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. That means that whatever they're saying needs to be in harmony with this book. Amen? Now, I'm going to stop here and there along the way, and I'd like to submit to you that I believe that Ellen White was a true prophet. And this is based on my own study and uh, uh, just the conviction of the evidence that I cannot escape. Here are some quotes from her own writings. She, not only are her books riddled with scripture, I don't know how many of you have read some of Ellen White's books, but if you read Great Controversy and Desire of Ages and Patriarchs and Prophets and Steps to Christ, geez, this dear lady wrote uh, 49 complete books and there are probably 150 compilations that are out there today that have been formed from various manuscripts and writings. Wrote more than any other woman in American history, if for no other reason. It probably deserves your attention to investigate what she wrote. Her books are translated into more languages than any other woman, any other woman author, if for no other reason. That ought to, that's, that's something. All right. Does she go by the Bible? From her own mouth. Some people say, oh, Seventh-day Adventist Christians, they go by Ellen White instead of the Bible. People who say that, it's just nothing personal, but it's ignorance. Uh, I'm a Bible Christian. When I teach the Bible everywhere I go, when I teach our message, I teach it from the Bible. It's very easy to show from the scripture. But now I'm going to read from her own pen how she felt about the Bible and its relationship for the Christian. This is from the book Great Controversy 593. The people of God are directed to the scriptures as their safeguard against the influences of false teachers and the delusive power of spirits of darkness. So closely will the counterfeit, especially in the last days, resemble the true that it will be impossible to distinguish between them except by the Holy Scriptures. By their testimony, every statement and every miracle must be tested. So she always said, test everything by the Bible. The Bible is the last word. Now, there are some churches out there that have a different scenario. But she constantly exalted the Bible. She never looked upon her writings as a substitute for the Bible. She looked upon them as a magnifying glass, an inspired commentary to give better understanding of the Bible. But the whole idea of everything she wrote was to ricochet the attention back to Jesus and the Bible. 
In itself, to me, that's some of the strongest evidence of the genuineness of her gift. Because so many other false prophets, they seem to like to capture some of the glory along the way for themselves. And, uh, you know, another way you can pretty quickly tell a false prophet is uh, when they send you an invoice for their prophecy. Or they ask for your credit card number before they give you their prophecy. Or they say, I got a prophecy for you, but first we're taking up the offering. I mean, I can't imagine Elijah saying to Ahab, dogs will eat Jezebel by the pool of Naboth, and that's going to cost you $9.95, but if you order now, get your credit card out. So a real prophet, you can't stop them from giving the prophecy. Money is not an object. As a matter of fact, Naaman, after being healed, he came to give Elisha the prophet money. He said, keep your money. You can't pay for salvation. Take it with you. Someone tried to pay Peter, who was a prophet, for the Holy Spirit. He said, your money perish with you to think that you can buy the gift of God. So anybody out there that's saying, I'm a prophet, and they're taking up donations, and, and uh, you've got to be very careful. One of the presidents of the General Conference, William A. Spicer, he was present the last time Ellen White spoke publicly at a church general assembly. And he said, I remember the last words this faithful servant ever spoke in the general assembly of the movement. And here were her words. She said, brethren and sisters, I commend unto you this book. And she held out the Bible. All that she said and did was to bring the Bible to the people. Now that's not the way with uh, a lot of churches. And you know, Seventh-day Adventists are not the only church that believes in the gift of prophecy. Uh, Pentecostals believe in the gift of prophecy. Uh, we know that Mormons believe in the gift of prophecy. The difference though is Joseph Smith, who was the primary prophet of the Mormon church, he claimed that his writings were superior or fresher information from the Bible and that his writings would trump the Bible. I know because I've studied with Mormons and when I show them what the Bible says about the Sabbath truth, they're speechless. They have to go to Joseph Smith's books and say, well, but we've got fresh revelation from Joseph Smith. And so his writings trump what the Bible says. And that I think is very dangerous. Number seven, what is the second test of a genuine prophet? Answer, 1 John 4 verse 2, Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Now, one of the ways that you can evaluate whether a person is a true prophet is if they say, well, Jesus is just one of the many incarnations of creation. Now, I mean, I've heard people say that before. Well, they're not really a prophet of God because they don't believe that God came in the flesh and that was Him. Or if they think that Jesus was just a man, or if they deny the resurrection, the fundamentals of who Christ was, uh, that right there is a, is a very strong flag that should alert you that this person is not a true prophet. I don't know if any of you have ever read the book Desire of Ages written by Ellen White, but it is one of the greatest, if not the greatest classic on the life of Christ. I don't know of any other, quite honestly. Matter of fact, the Library of Congress in the United States, where there are probably hundreds of different volumes written on the life of Christ, stated years ago that of all that this person had read, that the Desire of Ages was the most beautiful and most eloquent and most biblically accurate uh, demonstration of the life of Christ. I don't know if you've ever read that before, but it is a moving book. Number eight, what is the third test of a genuine prophet. Jeremiah 28 verse 9, when the word of the prophet shall come to pass. I mean, if Noah said, I'm a prophet, and he builds an ark and says a flood is coming, it doesn't come. Well, that's an indicator there could be problems. Now I need to say there, some of the prophecies that God's prophets gave were conditional. When Jonah told Nineveh that you're going to be destroyed, uh, that was conditional on their sins. But when they repented, God postponed that judgment. It did come years later. So if a prophet is prophesying something and it doesn't happen, that's an indicator. Real prophets of God, their information is dependable and their prophecies come true. You know, I just thought I'd give a couple of little samples. I could stay here all night, uh, but one of my battles tonight is having enough time to cover all of the material that we have. There are a couple of samples of some prominent things. Any of you ever read the book by Rene Neuerbergen called Prophet of Destiny? 
Rene Norbergen was not a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. He began, he wrote a book on Jean Dixon, who is definitely a false prophet. Prophet to the stars is what she was called. And he decided to write a book on Ellen White. When he got done, he became a Seventh-day Adventist. He began his book by exploring this incredible prophecy just before the San Francisco earthquake. In 1902, Ellen White wrote, not long hence, and I'll give you the reference, you know, this is Life Sketches, page 412. Not long hence, these cities will suffer, and she's speaking of uh, San Francisco and Oakland, will suffer under the wrath of God. They're becoming as Sodom and Gomorrah, and the Lord will visit them in wrath. Again, you can read in Testimonies, volume 9, page 92. On April 16, 1906, Ellen White wrote, during a vision of the night, I stood on an eminence from which I could see houses shaken like a reed in the wind. Buildings, great and small, were falling to the ground. Pleasure resorts, theaters, hotels, and homes of the wealthy were shaken and shattered. Many lives were blotted out of existence, and the air was filled with the shrieks of the injured and the terrified. Now that would have seemed a little bit sensational, except she writes this, and two days later, this historic San Francisco earthquake transpires. The city was just about flattened and destroyed by fire, and to the very word, everything that she had foretold, and she even mentioned cities that were heading for trouble. You know, it's interesting that uh, there are several times in history when God has visited some of these cities. I think I already told you that with judgments. Something else that uh, some people have wondered about. She made an interesting prophecy you can read about. It's in the book, Last Day Events, page 113. On one occasion, when in New York City, Manhattan, I was seen, I saw in the night season, I was called upon to behold, she's in vision, buildings rising story after story. Now when she has this vision, the buildings in New York maybe went up six, seven stories. They hadn't started reinforcing them with steel yet. These buildings were rising story after story. These buildings were warranted to be fireproof, and they were erected to glorify their owners and their buildings. Many of them were named after the companies and the builders. The scene that next passed before me looked like an alarm of fire. Men looked at the lofty, and she keeps talking about story after story and lofty, supposedly fireproof buildings and said they are perfectly safe. You know, after 9-11, the first plane hit, people were told to go back in the second building to their offices. They said everything's under control. But these buildings were consumed as if made by pitch. Pitch puts out a lot of black smoke. And the fire engines could do nothing to stay the destruction. The firemen were unable to operate the engines. I, I don't know. Maybe this is a mi misapplication. But it does make you pause, wouldn't you say? Number nine. What is the fourth test of a true prophet? Well, Matthew chapter 7, verse 16. It says, you will know them by their, what? By their fruits. Now to me, this is one of the, the strongest evidences for the genuineness of her life. You know, you can fool all of the people some of the time, and you can fool some of the people all of the time, but you can't fool all of the people all of the time. And if a person is claiming to be a Christian and they're really a hypocrite, it starts to come out, the skeletons eventually come out of the closet. But those that lived around Ellen White over her 87 years of life, which was way beyond the average, why uh, I'm mentioning that, all testified that she was a godly, holy, loving Christian woman, consistent, took people into her house all the time, cared for children, adopted many of them, raised them, gave away a lot of money. Matter of fact, the money from the royalties of her books she dedicated to uh, humanitarian causes and to education. Her life was very consistent with her message. She was a godly Christian woman. Matter of fact, at the time of her death, a member, a person who was not a member of the church, wrote in the obituary, the Mountain View Register Leader, this is July 23, 1915, um, in, Saint, uh, in Mountain View, California, Mrs. White's most enduring monument, aside from her godly life and conversation, conversation means your behavior, was her published works, which tend to be the purest morality, lead to Christ and to the Bible. Now this person standing on the outside looking in, what was their conclusion? Her writings did not say, look at me. 
It's a look at Christ, a look at the Bible, and a godly life. And they bring comfort and consolation to many weary hearts. She has done what she could, and now being dead yet speaketh through her writings. Now, having said that, I, I think it's a good idea for me to pause right here and remind everybody that prophets are also people. I've discovered that some people think that prophets, once a person is called and given the gift of prophecy, they sort of hover everywhere they go and they emit this glowing light and they got a halo and everything they say is a prophecy. You realize, of course, that like when a prophet sits down at dinner with other people and they say, please pass the salt, you don't write that down and say, I wonder what the spiritual meaning of that is. Uh, but there are people out there and, you know, there are folks that are sincere, but uh, they just don't use clear thinking and, and they forget that prophets are people. For instance, in the Bible, Miriam, she's called a prophetess. Isn't that right? Sister of Moses was a prophetess. Very clear in the Bible. But uh, did she make mistakes? Yeah. At one time she even had to be chastised by the Lord. He struck her with leprosy and then healed her later because she was giving her brother a hard time. Uh, I've got actually a list here in the Bible. Nathan the prophet. Prophets were not all knowing. They only knew what God showed them when he showed it. These are holy men and women that were moved by the Holy Spirit. God spoke through them, but they were still people like you and me in that respect. Their lives were consistent, they were godly, but they were not perfect. Do you understand the difference? There's only one human who's lived a perfect life. Who is that? That's Jesus. What does that imply? Everybody else had the frailties and they made mistakes. Nathan the prophet, for instance, one time, and by the way, this is in 1 Chronicles 17, verse 2 to 4. David is in his house. He's praying. David does not feel good because the ark is in a tent. The tent is already hundreds of years old. And David is thinking, I'm living in a house made of cedar. We should make a temple for the Lord. So Nathan the prophet's visiting David, and David says, I want to build a place for God. And Nathan says, sounds like a good idea. Go for it. Lord's with you, David. As Nathan is walking out, the word of the Lord came to Nathan and said, Nathan, go back and talk to David. You spoke too soon. That is not my plan. David is not to build the temple because he is a bloody man. He's guilty of shedding blood of innocent people. His son will build the house for me. And so the first time Nathan spoke, he was speaking like you and I would speak, sharing his opinion, saying, you know, God's been with you. It must be something God's leading you to do. Do it. God said, no, not David. He can get all the material, but Solomon's to build it. But don't miss that point. Nathan was a human. And he thought like normal people and used his judgment. Samuel the prophet. When God said, Samuel, stop crying about Saul. Samuel said, oh Lord, can't you do something to straighten Saul out? I sure wish. He's so big and tall and handsome and, and you know, and God said, you know, he's hopeless. He's grieved me away. Stop crying about him. Go pick someone from the sons of Jesse. So he goes, Samuel goes to meet with Jesse. says, gather your sons. Samuel looks at the tallest. You know, he's trying to find a replacement for Saul, who was a head and shoulders taller than everybody else. He looks at Eliab, I think it was. He says, ah, this must be the one. And God said, no, stop looking on the outside. Samuel was human. He thought, he looks like a king to me. This must be the one. God said, no, Samuel. So prophets had opinions. Their opinions were not always right. You listening? Uh, some people have taken some of these facts and it's, it's got them all twisted up. Paul was a prophet. How many agree? 1 Corinthians 7 verse 6, Paul says, but I speak this by permission and not by commandment. What did he mean by that? Well, he said, some things I'm sharing with you from the wisdom that God has given me just through experience, by permission. I don't have any word from God about this. And so he had the foresight to say, you may be reading my writings letter. Know that I'm saying this by permission and not by commandment. So and that's one example of this. 1 Corinthians 7, 25, Now concerning virgins, I have no commandment of the Lord, yet I give my judgment. Can you understand what Paul's saying here? 2 Corinthians eleven seventeen, That which I speak, I speak it not after the Lord, but as it were foolishly. Paul said, look, let me speak like a fool for a minute. And so, just trying to give you perspective. You know, one time Paul had to chastise Peter. Because even after Peter was converted and he's out preaching, he's been filled with the Holy Spirit, after Pentecost, Paul had to pull Peter aside and say, Peter, you know, you're being a little hypocritical because when the Jews aren't around, you're just hanging out with the Gentiles, but when the Jews come from Jerusalem, you're acting like you don't know the Gentiles. You're being two-faced. 
Have you read Galatians where Paul does that? Was Peter a prophet? Yeah, but these, they were people. And uh, Ellen White was human too. But her life was every bit as godly and consistent as these lives that you see here. Elijah the prophet, was he a prophet? I mean, you know, hey, if you get a heavenly escort to heaven before you die, you're doing something right. And yet Elijah got discouraged. He got, you know, I, <laughs> it's interesting to me that Peter was ready to die for Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane when the mob came to arrest him. When he was surrounded by his friends, he pulled out a sword. He was ready to fight these men. He wasn't afraid. A little later, a girl started to make fun of him, and he buckled. Elijah stood up to 400 and, uh, 850 prophets of Baal and prophets of the grove. Later, Jezebel sends him a message, and he runs for the wilderness. Men are intimidated by women, aren't they? <laughs> and when Elijah gets out there in the wilderness, he prays that he might die. Well, do prophets get discouraged? Are they people? I mean, do prophets always do exactly what they're told? What about Jonah? How many agree Jonah was a prophet? The Bible calls him a prophet. God says to Jonah, Jonah, I got a message for you to deliver. I want you to go east. He goes west. Did he stop being a prophet when he went the wrong way, or did God just get his attention and send him back the right way? Sometimes prophet, prophets are reluctant to give their messages. When Ella White was first called, she said, Oh, Lord, please, I'm shy. I can't do this. And then she realized how it grieved Jesus, and she loved Jesus so much. And she said, I can't bear to think of the frown of Jesus upon me. And so she said, Lord, if you promise to be with me and give me the strength, I'll do what you're asking me to do. But she was extremely reluctant to be in this position of visibility. Very humble, shy person naturally, and it always took the power of God to give her the strength to get up in front of anybody and to write some of the difficult things that she had to write. Something else I've noticed as I read through the Bible is that generally prophets are not accepted in their own day. It takes a while for it to settle in. When Paul first was converted and he started to preach, the church ran from him. They wouldn't even, they said, we, we know what you're up to. And finally Barnabas took him in and gradually it took a period of time of proving himself before they started to accept him. Finally Peter had to write a letter and say, even our beloved brother Paul, as he's written to you in his letter, Peter kind of gave him an endorsement. Because up till then when he was first called, they said, he's two-faced. He was killing Christians, now he's preaching, he's a hypocrite. They said, it's just, it's political. Or maybe he got fired by the Sanhedrin, he's just looking for another job. I mean, uh, folks are like that, you know. When Jesus first came, uh, there was a lot of criticism. Then his writings and his truth and the evidence uh, began to spread across the world. So I just wanted to spend a moment or two talking about that. Uh, another misconception I'd like to spend a moment on is some people have thought that Ellen White was the founder of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. How many of you have heard that before? Now, Ellen White was really one of many founders. It was a group of people. Matter of fact, in some senses, you could probably argue that a, a sea captain by the name of Joseph Bates may have been more of a founder. He's the one that brought the Sabbath truth to Ellen White. And uh, just a very godly man. I'll tell you what, if you want to read an exciting autobiography, read the autobiography of Joseph Bates. Starts out as a cabin boy and has the most harrowing adventures and in prison and in war and just uh, quite an adventure. And one of the... You ever eat lima beans? How many of you don't like lima beans? Do you know where lima beans come from? A sea captain named Joseph Bates picked them up in Lima, Peru and brought them up to South America and introduced them to North America. So you can blame Adventists for lima beans and cornflakes. <laughs> so. Number 10. Are miracles definite evidence of a true prophet? I is that the way that you know whether prophets do? And do all prophets perform miracles? Well, first of all, let's answer this. Revelation 16, verse 14. Speaking of in the last days, you need to be careful, for they are the spirits of devils working miracles. Can devils work miracles? You know, in the last days, I think a lot of people would be more inclined to follow a prophet that entertained them with miracles and signs and wonders than a prophet who said, you need to turn from your life of sin. 
And a lot of the criticism that Ellen White gets, you know what it is because of? The foundation for most of the criticism is because of the high standard for godly living that she holds up. Uh, people are convicted by it and they try to shake off the, the shackles of sanctification and so they say, oh, that, it can't really be that high. Does God really, I mean, can't, you, can't we sort of be more contemporary with the world? Whenever the church starts trying to be more contemporary with the world and fit in with the world, uh, that's a sign usually right there there are problems. Oh, I forgot one more passage. The, the story in the Bible when Moses went before the Pharaoh and uh, the Pharaoh, was he able to duplicate a lot of the miracles that came with the plagues? And so the devil knows how to counterfeit signs and wonders. Not all prophets are called to foretell the future. Not every prophet writes a book. Have you ever read the book of John the Baptist? And yet what does the Lord say about John the Baptist? Well, he was the greatest of the prophets. Uh, and so you look at the prophets of God in the Bible, they're not all marching up and down the street foretelling calamity and disaster. Matter of fact, one of the most important works of a prophet is to guide, to instruct, to console, to help give understanding and, and uh, help people become better acquainted with the Lord. And this was largely the ministry of Ellen White. But she taught on such a broad spectrum of subjects, it's mind-boggling. Number 11. Were some women also called to be prophets in the Bible? Exodus 15, verse 20. We're going to go through some of these very quickly. Of course, we've already talked about Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron. She's the one who protected Moses as a baby as well. Luke 2, verse 36. Now there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Penuel of the tribe of Asher. You remember when they went into the temple? And uh, when Joseph and Mary brought baby Jesus, Anna was there. New Testament, she's a prophetess. You got Hannah, you got Huldah. Then you can go to the New Testament also, Acts uh, 21 verse 9. Now this man, Philip, had four virgin daughters who prophesied. And so why you don't find any examples in the Bible of women serving in the capacity of apostle or a priest, there are a lot of women in ministry as prophets. Deborah was a prophetess. There's many more than I could share with you right now. Number 12, in what way does God speak to a true prophet? Well, there's a number of examples. Numbers 12, verse 6 and 8, If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known to him in a vision, or I will speak to him in a dream. Dreams and visions are a couple of ways right there. I might speak with him as I speak, speaking of Moses in particularly, mouth to mouth. Zechariah 4 verse 1, And the angel that talked with me came again. You remember an angel went to Mary as well. So God speaks to his prophets through dreams, through visions. He'll speak through the Holy Spirit. He speaks through angels. Ellen White had the Lord speak to her in just about every way that God can speak to a prophet. She was given dreams. She was given, given visions. Matter of fact, I've got uh, a, a statement here. Uh, there's a whole lot of witnesses, and you can, you can read a number of these things are available. For instance, J. N. Loughborough, he wrote, he saw her in vision many, many times. She was in vision more than 2,000 times in her life. And many people saw her in vision. They examined her in vision. And I mean, when you have some, a practice like this for 70 years, there are plenty of opportunity for people to criticize it. In passing into vision, uh, Jane Loughborough says, she gives three enrapturing shouts of glory which echo and re-echo the second and especially the third fainter but more thrilling than the first. The voice resembling that of one quite a distance from you and going out of hearing, her voice would become faint and she'd say, glory, glory, glory. For about four or five seconds she seems to drop down like a person who's in a swoon or one having lost his strength. Then she seems to instantly be filled with superhuman strength, sometimes rising at once to her feet and walking about the room. There are frequent movements of the hands and the arms pointing to the right or the left as her head turns. All these movements are made in a most graceful manner. In whatever position the hand or the arm might be placed, it is impossible for anyone to move it. Many people seeing her in vision would try to go stop her arms as they made these graceful gestures. And especially when she was younger, she was a slight woman. They could not stop her hand. It would throw them around the room. And she just showed absolutely no effort at all. Her eyes were always open. 
but she does not wink. You can read about when Balaam the prophet says, my eyes being open in vision. But she does not wink, and some of her visions would last hours. Try not to blink for 20 minutes. Try not to blink. As a matter of fact, you can try not to blink now for the next five minutes. Let me know how it goes. <laughs> she does not wink. Her head is raised and she's looking upward, not with a vacant stare, with a pleasant expression, only differing from the normal in that she appears to be looking intently at some distant object. She does not breathe. One of the most common things people see in her envision would put a mirror to her mouth, a candle to her face. She would not wink when a candle was put up in front of her eyes. She, it would not affect the direction of her eyes. She was lost to the world and what was happening in the world. She was caught up and God was showing her things and bringing her back with messages for the church. Do you believe God still has a church? Does God still speak to His church? Are the gifts of the Spirit still there? There are plenty of false prophets out there, friends, but don't become so cynical and jaded that you reject the true. I've also got a bunch of similar references here. M.G. Kellogg. I believe this was the father of John Harvey Kellogg. Um, she would draw her breath, and when she came out of vision, when it was over, she'd take a deep breath, and she'd always say it was so dark, coming back to the world after the things that she saw. One time while she was in vision, she was holding up a book. She was in vision. She picked up a Bible, and I've seen a Bible about the same size in Washington at the E.G. White estate where the vault is, and uh, she would point to the verses and someone standing there, and she was reading word for word the verses, looking with her finger, and she held for over 20 minutes this Bible that must have weighed 15 pounds. You can't do that. I'm just supernatural strength. And many, many people saw these things. Oh, another myth I'd like to dispel very quickly. I've heard people talk about, yeah, they got these secret writings of Ellen White. There's nothing secret about it. You can go to the Ellen White estate, and I've been in the vault before, and you can look at the, the writings, and, and uh, that's just a myth. She wrote about education. She must have known what she's talked about because through her leadership and her guidance, right now the Seventh-day Adventist Church has about 6,966 schools all around the world. Many times she would find the campuses and say, the Lord said, buy this campus, buy this campus, and it always prospered when she did that, such as Loma Linda University, which is now a world-renowned information on hospitals. And uh, Loma Linda, of course, was uh, a hospital on health, 167 hospitals and sanitariums around the world. It is the largest Protestant medical work in the world now, ninth grade education. God guide her, guided her in that medicine. Uh, some of you maybe have read Neil Nedley's book, Proof Positive. In the appendix of that book, and I've only got a couple of uh, room and time for a couple of quotes, you read Ellen White's words, the appetite for tobacco is self-destructive. It leads to a craving for something stronger, fermented wines and liquors of which are intoxicating. Keep in mind, when she wrote that, they thought she was crazy because doctors prescribed smoking for asthma when she wrote that. And now what does medical science tell us? Children who use tobacco are more likely to go on in use in sequence to use alcohol, marijuana, and other illegal drugs. Ellen White's words. Lately I have read of the death of many men. Their death is almost always attributed to failure of the heart, but in reality the use of tobacco and liquor has poisoned the system, many of them. What does medical science support today? Each year in America, as many as 300,000 cardiovascular disease deaths are the direct result of cigarette smoking, and we also know alcohol is a large contributor. Ella White's words speaking on diet, Grains, fruits, nuts, and vegetables impart a vigor to, of intellect, that is, not afforded by a more complex and stimulating diet. A simpler diet is better. What are we hearing everywhere from modern science today? Meat contains a substance that impairs brain activity and lacks a substance that the brain needs to function well. And I left out all of the supporting references, but like I said, this is a Neil Nedley's book, Proof Positive in the Appendix, and uh, I recommend that to you. On publishing. There are, she said that her books would be going around the world like streams of light that'd be spread like the leaves of autumn. Has that been fulfilled, friends? 65 publishing houses, and those are just the authorized church ones. There's a lot of private ones printing her material all around the world. Testimonies, volume 8, per page 87. She said, years ago, the Lord gave me special directions that buildings should be erected in various places, America, Europe, and other lands, for the publication of literature containing the light of present truth. 
From our books and papers, bright beams of light are to shine forth to enlighten the world regard to, in regard to present truth. That's been fulfilled. Books are all over the world. American Library of Congress has recognized Ellen White as the fourth most translated author in the world, not just among women. Uh, oh, I said, I, you know, I, I misquoted something. I said her highest grade of education was ninth grade. It was third grade. I misspoke. Some have accused Ellen White. Uh, it says that Ellen White copied from other writers. Have you heard that before? I'll tell you, boy, if there's ever a, a, a ridiculous argument. Have you ever read the Bible and noticed how many times they, they quote each other and give no credit or respect? In the 1800s when Christian writers wrote, they often uh, quoted large sections from one another and they considered it very bad form or taste to say, I'm giving credit to this Christian pastor for this and to this Christian for that. That was considered getting the glory for the person instead of giving the glory to God. There was never any accusations in her day or any suit brought against her for plagiarism. You know, Jesus, when he was hanging on the cross, said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Do you realize he was quoting Psalm 22 and he didn't give David credit for that? <laughs> Jude quotes Peter. Peter quotes Paul. And they don't give credit. 10% of the New Testament, Jesus is quoting the Old Testament. Most of the time, he doesn't cite the author. And so, many times in my sermons, I read inspired things and I, my mind seizes. I say, praise the Lord, that's true. Then I'm standing before people and it comes back to me and I share it with them as I'm preaching. And I don't even remember where I read it. But I knew that the principle, the statement was true. Number 13. What three things does Paul command regarding prophecy? 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 20. Despise not prophesying. Prove all things. Hold fast to that which is good, friends. 2 Chronicles 20 verse 20. Believe in the Lord your God and you will be established. Believe his prophets and you will prosper. Do you want to be established? Do you want to be established on the rock, friends? I invite you to taste and to see that the Lord is good. Except it tends to be the habit in the church. Jesus said, O Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone the ones who are sent unto you. The church traditionally through history, they embrace the false and they reject the true. I just want to give you my own personal testimony. At 17, I was living up in the mountains in a cave. And I read the Bible, accepted Jesus. And I went to different churches and they all disagreed and there was so much confusion in Babylon, I didn't know what to do. I went back to the cave up in the mountains. I'd accepted Christ. And I got on my knees and I said, Lord, there's one Bible, one Jesus. I want to know what is the truth. Someone came by my cave that had been raised a Seventh-day Adventist gave me the book, Great Controversy. God delivered it to me, a cave, 3,500 feet up in these desert mountains. I read that book and I said, I don't know who wrote this, but it's inspired. And I went back to my friend. I said, get me some more of this book and I'd like to talk to the author. He said, well, you're a little late. <laughs> but uh, the best preparation I've had for ministry is from reading the things that Ellen White wrote. Some of you have heard of Paul Harvey. He said, her writings have been translated into 148 languages more than Marx or Tolstoy or Shakespeare. Only now the world is coming to appreciate her recommended prescription for optimum spiritual and physical health. Ellen White, you don't know her, get to know her. I understand he was baptized a Seventh-day Adventist in 2000. Friends, I would ask you to taste and to see have you heard of the book Steps to Christ? Start there. Read Desire of Ages. Read Great Controversy. John was outside of the church. You can come out, John. I don't know if there's time for you to sing, but you can stand next to me. <laughs> John also is a product. Uh, he was out living a crazy life. Maybe I ought to let him share his own testimony sometime. And what, where'd he go? <laughs> what book did you read? Great Controversy. Same thing. It's another thing we, we have in common and got him grounded in the church. And you probably had a lot of friends that were raised in the church and they're not still there. That's right. But uh, those that get rooted in the faith, in the inspired testimony, they're the ones who prosper, friends. All right, you have time to sing a little bit? You got a minute before I pray. All the way my 
Savior leads me, what have I to ask beside? Can I doubt His tender mercies, who through life have been my guide? Heavenly peace, divinest comfort, here by faith in Him to dwell. For I know whatever befalls me, Jesus doeth all things well. For I know whatever befalls me, Jesus doeth all things well. Amen. He'll lead you. God still speaks through people. He still inspires. He still guides. I'd like to invite you to prove the prophets, friends. Apply the biblical tests. You can't be down on something you're not up on, can you? And there's enough evidence there where I think that it's worthy of investigation. Would you be willing to say, as I close with prayer tonight, Lord, I'm willing to take an honest, objective look at the ministry and the writings of Ellen White and see what it does in my heart. That's why I am still uh, in love with the, the messages because it moves me to want to be like Jesus. Is that your desire, friends? Amen. Father in heaven, I pray that each person watching now will, with an open mind and heart, investigate this gift of prophecy that you've given the church. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.